It was the last image of the girl's life. Eleven days later, she appeared in a suitcase by the pond, and the girl was dead. Everyone wants to know who the killer is, what was his motive. The time was March 27, 2009, in a small town in California. Sandra, an eight-year-old girl, was coming home from school. Sandra is very popular in the town, and there is hardly anyone who doesn't recognize her. She is very friendly and eager to help others. She has a big smile and captures hearts. Sandra is in second grade. Usually after school she would go to a nearby park to play with her friends. All the residents here knew each other and pretty much trusted each other. However, hours passed and Sandra still hadn't come home until dinner time. Mom became worried and she called her friends to ask them, but no one knew where Sandra was. Mom quickly called the police for help, Janet, the chief of the town's police department. She has just taken office. She is very concerned about Sandra's well-being. The police quickly launched an investigation and checked the security cameras. Soon, they caught a glimpse of Sandra. She had appeared on the surveillance footage at 4 p.m. Sandra was wearing a pink t-shirt and black pants. It was only one clue, but it was very important. It would help the police know Sandra's features. It could also pinpoint a time frame. That night, the police and surrounding neighborhood were desperately searching for Sandra dot dot but until dawn, they still hadn't found anything. Sandra had just disappeared. Janet put out a missing child emergency bulletin, and she was hoping for more help, because she knows that 97% of children who are abducted are killed. The more time that passed, the slimmer Sandra's chances of survival became. Luckily, the bulletin caught the attention of the FBI, the Child Abduction Rapid Action Team. 16 hours after Sandra's disappearance, agents led by Joseph went into action. They used more resources. Some agents were tasked with questioning the neighborhood and they got a lead. On the afternoon of Sandra's disappearance, there had been a female neighbor who indicated that her suitcase had been stolen. The agents wondered if the tip had anything to do with Sandra. Some other officers searched with dogs and followed Sandra's scent. But Sandra's scent disappeared around the corner. This made the police feel bad. Because the park on the corner is home to sex offenders, parolees, and other people who are very dangerous. The police found a man who had tried to kiss Sandra in the park two years earlier. But he told the police he didn't mean any harm, and he had no criminal record, and the police found no useful clues. Although the search operation lasted a week and involved 200 to 250 people, it was the largest search operation in Northern California. But very sadly, Sandra was not found. It was like she disappeared into thin air. But everyone still believes she is alive. Residents of the town prayed for Sandra. People lit candles and filled the trees with dolls. Even some agents and police officers got involved. But something unexpected happened. A female neighbor became so agitated that she screamed at the top of her lungs. The agents went to check it out along with the police. The note on the floor shocked everyone. The note read, Cantu is in stolen luggage in water at Pachetti in Whitehall, signed witness. The investigators quickly took the note away, and they had some questions. Because the note contained intentional misspellings, investigators believed that someone was intentionally hiding the handwriting. To verify the authenticity of this information, the agents and police went to the pond to investigate. However, the pond is so complicated that they don't know where to start looking, and it's hard to confirm whether Sandra's body is in the water. Things seem to be back to square one. Agents and police redirected their investigation to the female neighbor who found the note. The female neighbor's name was Teresa. On the first day of Sandra's disappearance, she had indicated that her suitcase had been stolen. These two clues raised suspicion. When the investigation began, however, Teresa gave a very strong alibi. She said she was setting up in her father's church on the afternoon of Sandra's disappearance. She also produced call logs proving that she had spoken briefly with the park ranger on the church's phone. Still, agents and police persisted in their investigation. Soon, they found a note in Teresa's car. More suspicious circumstances arose. By comparing the notes, they realized that there were three words at the bottom of this note. And the note found at the prayer meeting had the same words. Could this note have been written by Teresa? The agents continued to Teresa's room where they found a notebook. The paper in the notebook was the same as the note, 
and the notebook was missing a page. Teresa's suspicions were getting higher and higher. The police took her in for questioning. Surprisingly, Teresa again provided new clues. Teresa stated that Sandra occasionally went to a father and son's house to play, and the agents examined the father and son's collection. Surprisingly, they had saved pictures of Sandra. They admitted that Sandra had visited the home, but they had committed no crime. The agents searched their home carefully and found no human skeletons. The agents have to use a polygraph, but the results are worrisome as none of them passed the test. Neither Teresa nor the father and son have been picked up as suspects in the crime. But the tragedy had already happened. On the 11th day of Sandra's disappearance, a worker found a suitcase by the pond, and they quickly called the police. Agents and police quickly arrived on the scene and everyone was very curious to know if Sandra was in the suitcase. The suitcase was taken back to the lab and given to the coroner. By this time the medical examiner could smell death. He cut the white rope tying the suitcase short and opened it. Inside was a little girl who was curled up in the suitcase like a baby. After the coroner's investigation, it was confirmed that the girl was Sandra. Everyone's hopes were shattered. The death report showed that Sandra had been given a strong sedative and that there were no visible injuries on her body. The coroner determined that she had been anesthetized before being thrown into the pond. Chief Janet brought the sad news to Sandra, S family, who couldn't stop crying, but everyone was even more eager to know the truth. Sandra's death did not mean the investigation was over. The agents and police reorganized the clues. The appearance of the suitcase makes Teresa's suspicions rise again. The investigator tries to take a lie detector test for Teresa, but she is very uncooperative and even tries to swallow the razor blade. Teresa was taken to the hospital for resuscitation, but they didn't stop there. They learned what Teresa was going through. She suffered from severe schizophrenia and needed medication to maintain a stable mood. She had also been known to steal and commit arson. A parent even accused her of giving juice with added drugs to some children, but that time the accusation didn't take effect. In an attempt to disprove Teresa's alibi, agents and police officers went to search the church. They found a rolling pin in the kitchen with some blood on it. They needed to run a lab test on the blood, and while waiting for the results, Teresa was released from the hospital. Investigators tapped her phone and they made an even more shocking discovery. Teresa tried to invite Sandra's sister to the house, and she seemed to have a new plan. For the safety of the children, the police decided to arrest Teresa immediately. After five hours in the interrogation room, Teresa finally broke down, and she began to cry. It was an accident. Actually, it's happened. Killed Sandra was playing hide and seek at the time, and she hid in the suitcase. But Teresa didn't see it. She carried the suitcase to her car and went to work at the church. When she opened the suitcase, Sandra was not breathing. All she could do was throw the suitcase and Sandra into the pond. Her testimony was enough for the police to arrest her for murder. The police broke the news to Sandra's family, who were shocked. But that's not the whole truth, because the lab results from the rolling pin came back. It proves that Sandra's death was no accident. The blood on the rolling pin came from Sandra, which suggests that she had been to church. Putting all the clues together proves that Teresa's murder of Sandra was premeditated. Soon the investigators restore the truth of what happened to Sandra. Sandra was last seen on surveillance footage walking toward Teresa's home. Citing a need for help, Teresa takes Sandra to the church and makes her drink juice with a sedative added. Soon Sandra falls into a coma. During this time, she uses the church's phone to call a park ranger and report the theft of her suitcase. Also creating an alibi, she then murdered Sandra with a rolling pin and placed them in the suitcases and finally threw them in the pond. Sandra was dead before her mom called the police. Teresa was convicted of kidnapping and murder, and she was sentenced to death and remains in prison. But when the judge asked her about her motive for killing, she couldn't give an answer because she didn't know why she did it. It could have been to create a sensation. It could have been to get attention. Sandra's case may be over, but she will always be in the hearts of those who caught her killer.